What we're going to be talking about today is, is my learnings from being an analyst and then more recently some learnings I've had from joining Excelsius for this past six months um, to just talk about why liquid cooling is the future of AI factories and potentially some of the various forms of liquid cooling that we'll, we'll see uh, evolve to over the next couple of uh, years. So with that being said, we're going to start um, talking just about traditional air cooling just real briefly. Um, I think we've covered this pretty well today so far, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but really, it's just a physics uh, problem. Um, you know, air has low thermal conductivity, so when it comes to, you know, dense AI racks and workloads, um, it's just fundamentally inefficient at removing that large amount of heat. Um, and so what that means from a... a, a rack density perspective, you know, you can see 20, 30 kilowatts uh, per rack with air cooling, um, but beyond that you start to run into some challenges, um, particularly with hot, pot, hot spots in the servers, um, as well as the energy consumption that we've talked about today as well. You know, up to 40% of uh, data centers energy use can come from cooling. And we have seen that number actually come down over the past handful of years. Um, but a lot of that actually is related to water usage as well. So if you're reducing your electricity usage, you're very possibly increasing your, your water usage there. So still using a lot of resources. So air cooling doesn't work because of uh, physics for AI workloads. So that means we're going to talk about liquid cooling solutions here. Um, and at the beginning of my uh, analyst career, um, I actually thought it was going to be immersion cooling that was going to win out for the... Uh, a mainstream liquid cooling solution in the data center industry. Um, and a big part of that was that, you know, immersion cooling is a 100% heat capture solution. Um, so, you know, you submerge that server in the tank, um, it captures nearly all that heat, maybe you're gonna need a little bit of comfort cooling um, for, the, for the humans in that facility, but otherwise that immersion tank is gonna take care of all that heat capture. Um, however, there were there and, and are some challenges with immersion cooling still. Um, you know, first and foremost, it is a horizontal tank form factor, um, so looks a little bit different when you plan, design your facility, operate and maintain that facility. You really have to build a new playbook to do that. Um, in the time that liquid cooling has been adopted, um, you know, over these past handful of years, um, the data center industry has been moving full speed ahead as fast as we can. Um, so it's been a difficult time to uh, uh, rewrite that playbook for immersion cooling. Um, ecosystem compatibility is another big factor as well here. Um, you know, what, what compute can I put in my immersion tank? What networking can I put in my immersion tank? Do I need, you know, power infrastructure? Um, and, 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 you know, that's something that, you know, we're hearing more and more about, and there's a lot of progress happening there, but still more work is needed to go on that ecosystem compatibility uh, front. Um, and then I, I want to touch on a couple of differences between single-phase immersion and, and two-phase immersion. Um, so for single-phase immersion, um, there are some performance limitations when it comes to high TDP, high heat flux processors. Um, and that's not to say that, that immersion cooling, single-phase immersion cooling, can't cool, uh, you know, 1,000 plus watt processors, um, but they've already had to start to adopt some uh, innovations and technologies to make that possible. So, seen forced convection heat sinks, um, and now talking about these hybrid directed chip um, solutions, bringing that coldest fluid uh, right on uh, to basic, basically an open face cold plate um, to keep that processor cool there. Um, on the two-phase side of things for immersion, um, you know, that requires a specially designed fluid. Um, Got to think about cost and, and regulations there. Um, and so two-phase immersion to date is probably the technology, the liquid cooling technology that is furthest away from um, any adoption. So now I want to jump to single-phase directed chip and, and uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, and, and really, this is where we see the chip and server OEMs um, you know, dictating this liquid cooling technology today, um, in part because it still sits in that familiar vertical form factor. Um, so it's that nice vertical form factor. You got cold plates um, sitting on top of your processors, um, and it's it's it, it works well. Um, there's also foundational knowledge and supply chain around um, single phase directed chip, and a lot of that comes from the HPC high performance computing industry or supercomputing industry. Um, where uh, there's been, been learnings for more than a decade on single-phase directed chip. Um, a few characteristics about single-phase directed chip that I like to highlight. Um, you know, the industry seems to be standardizing on PG25 for the solution there, um, which is 25% propylene glycol, 
75% uh, water. Um, and if there is a leak there, that is harmful to IT equipment. Um, and if you've been around, uh, you know, liquid cooling deployments, um, leaks do happen. Um, and with the cost of this infrastructure, it can be uh, pretty catastrophic. You're talking about $3 million uh, of IT equipment in Iraq there. Um, there are a couple performance levers for a single phase directed chip that you can use. Um, so flow rates and facility water system temperatures. Um, so, you know, you can crank up your facility water system temperatures, or, or your, your flow rates, excuse me, um, to, to get more performance. You can also lower your facility water system temperatures to increase your performance. Um, some trade-offs there, um, you know, potentially in terms of risks, um, where, where you could have particles breaking off of your cold plates and clogging your, uh, uh, the, the fins in there. Um, and then also, you know, colder facility water system temperatures just means you're going to be using more energy. Um, and then fluid maintenance. And this has been one of the biggest um, takeaways that I've learned um, the past six months being at Excelsius um, is the amount of effort and, and, and work power needed um, on these this facility maintenance. And so there's, you know, quality testing, um, you know, additives such as biocides and inhibitors, um, and then filter changes all required on the single phase directed chip side. Now, for two-phase directed chip, um, still a relatively nascent technology compared to single-phase directed chip. Um, there's a couple different flavors or varieties there. Um, so there is passive. Um, don't really see passive um, uh, uh, two-phase directed chip uh, in the industry or in the data center industry, I should say. Um, what we're really seeing is pumped two-phase with flow and pool boiling options. Um, Excelsius known for flow boiling, Zutacor known for pool boiling there. Um, and kind of the magic behind two-phase directed chip cooling uh, really is in that fluid, the, re the refrigerants that's used there. And so, you know, when it comes to those two-phase systems, um, you know, we use at Excelsius uh, eco-friendly, commercially available refrigerants. Um, they're used in other applications like chillers for data centers, um, industrial process as well. Um, and, and one of the key characteristics that they have is that they are um, ITE safe, dielectric uh, refrigerants. So if you do have a leak, um, you do not, uh, it will not cause any damage to that IT infrastructure. Um, a couple other characteristics associated with two-phase directed chip that I like to highlight. Um, because of the phase change in the process in that cold plate, um, it has a very cooling process um, across the entire chip. So no, no gradient uh, cold on one side and then heating up on the other side as you go through that chip. Um, and it's really about that boiling process that kind of stirs that fluid for that thermal uniformity. Um, and, and because of that boiling process, um, that also enables uh, flow rates uh, four to nine times lower than single phase directed chip. Um, and you can actually enable your facility water systems to be six to eight degrees Celsius warmer, um, potentially even, even higher here, but um, being relatively conservative in, in, in what we can do with the technology today. So key takeaway from this slide from my perspective, um, while we are seeing some opportunities for cooling in the market, um, I don't believe that uh, you know, for these, these large AI factories, immersion cooling is gonna be the technology that wins out there, um, but really the directed chip technologies is, is where the industry is headed. And so I wanna talk a little bit about processors and, and, and why we see the need for two phase in the coming years. So looking at this chart here, um, across the x-axis, we're just really looking at chip packaging and it getting more dense. Um, and on the y-axis, we could be talking about um, heat flux or TDP. Um, we, in the data center industry, we often focus on TDP, but it's really heat flux that drives the cooling requirements or cooling challenges um, when it comes to liquid cooling. Um, so when you start to go above 100 watts centimeter squared, um, that is where we've pushed out of air cooling to uh, single phase directed chip liquid cooling. Um, and that really started with traditional cold plates, sky fin cold plates um, uh, were needed there. Um, but we're already seeing some innovation happen there. So as we move to uh, uh, you know, higher heat flux, higher TDP processors, um, you know, there's, there's had to been some more advanced cold plates designed, uh, split flow systems, uh, jet impingement cold plates um, to get better performance there. So if we look at this uh, green dot up there, um, that's actually some testing results from Cool IT earlier this year where they had a 4,000 watt like processor um, that that had a, a heat flux of 160 watts per centimeter squared. Um, really Im impressive results that they were able to capture there, cooling that. Um, 
but somewhere between that 150 watts to, to 200 uh, watts per centimeter squared is where you know, analysts and, and, and the industry talk about a transition from single phase directed chip to two phase directed chip. Um, and so what we have there then as the blue dot is some testing Excelsius did back in 2023 um, associated with the OCP Global Summit um, where we tested a processor up to 250 watts per centimeter squared. Um, and then earlier this year, we also demonstrated the ability to cool a 4,500 watt processor. But it's not all about performance when it comes to two-phase. Um, there's also cost uh, savings or advantages with two-phase. Um, so when I got at, invited to speak at this conference, this was probably the slide I was most excited to put up here um, because we were working with some prospective customers um, in Singapore um, and, and talking about the free cooling that two-phase enabled in a region like Singapore. Um, so we did an analysis where we looked at a competitive single-phase directed to chip uh, cooling solution um, overlaid here is, is um, just some ASHRAE data um, that shows the temperatures uh, in Singapore and, and, and how many hours out of the year you can capture free cooling. Um, and so what we found that was for single phase direct to chip, we were able to do free cooling 24% of the year, um, but using a six degree Celsius facility, uh, warmer facility water system, um, we were able to actually improve that to 97% of free cooling throughout the year, which in a region like Singapore um, just goes to show how, how that boiling process is at, at capturing and removing heat from that chip. So next, I just want to talk a little bit about what Excelsius is doing to, um, you know, in participation with OCP and, and help commercialize this two-phase direct-to-chip liquid cooling technology. Um, so looking at this um, first chart on the left here, um, this was some results we published in uh, 2024 at the OCP Global Summit. Um, this uh, project was actually led by Intel, um, where we were working on a universal cold plate. Um, and so it was actually a cold plate designed for... Uh, a PG25 solution, but we used two of our different refrigerants, uh, R1233ZDE and R515B, and both of those showcased lower thermal resistance than um, the PG25 solution, um, so very much in support of this idea of universal cold plates, um, semiconductors shipped with the cold plates already attached to them. Um, then earlier this year at the uh, EMEA Summit, <coughs> excuse me, um, we uh, did some testing and, and showcased the results on variable orientations of cold plates. So we looked at horizontal upward, which is just your standard um, cold plate configuration, horizontal downward, so think about that as upside down on the, on the bottom of the board there, and, as well as uh, vertical orientation. Um, and some pretty interesting results there where we saw horizontal upward and downward um, actually show the lowest thermal resistance um, at, at lower uh, TDP processors um, and the vertical orientation perform better uh, for higher TDP processors. And then lastly, something else we've published this year um, in the OCP cold plate working group is a pumped two-phase directed chip white paper um, with a number of partners. Um, um, and, and really that uh, white paper just providing an overview of the pumped two-phase uh, technology as well as some of the ecosystem effort uh, work that is happening there um, to, to, to use existing components but also um, tailor those, those components to be adaptable and work with two-phase solutions as well. Um, and that's going to be some ongoing work that we're going to continue to do there. Um, so so uh, definitely pay attention to that work stream and work group. And then just lastly here, I want to talk through some um, Celsius products and solutions that we have on the market today. Um, so first here on the left, we have our IR80. That's our in-rack 80 kilowatt liquid cooling capacity CDU. Um, that's the first product we came out with last year. Um, and we've seen that product um, have some success with H100, H200 deployments, um, you know, general HPC infrastructure um, with enterprise and co-location end users. Um, and then actually jumping to the far right here, we have our LSS and TSR systems, so load simulation sleds and thermal simulation rack, um, which uh, um, replicates kind of down to that chip level um, uh, 
you know, performance requirements, so you're able to gather data on the performance of your CDU on site at location where your actual data center is. Um, and then this has actually been a very popular product with ecosystem partners for testing new, new products, testing developments to be able to pull together, um, you know, bring that whole uh, ecosystem together to continue to innovate with two-phase uh, liquid cooling solutions. And then lastly in the middle here, we have our MR250. Um, and this is one product that we're really proud of. Um, stands for multi-rack, 250 kilowatts of liquid cooling capacity. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first floor standing two-phase CDU on the market. Um, you can set it up in a couple different configurations. Um, so you can do two 125 kW racks or one 250 kW rack, um, which really is aligned with you know, MVL72 type deployments or larger GPU clusters. Um, and one thing we're really proud about with this uh, MR250 product um, is that we've tested this up to um, 250 kilowatts with 40 degrees C facility water. Um, so again, able to achieve a very efficient thermal process with that higher facility water temperature based on that, that, that boiling process that happens with the two-phase uh, directed chip liquid cooling solution. So with that said, um, you know, uh, a, a Celsius is, uh, has a lot of exciting things in the work in Southeast Asia, um, but you know, we need more of an ecosystem here. Um, so if you wanna be you know, part of that Celsius ecosystem, please get in touch. Um, feel free to grab me in the hallways, say hi, ask questions. Um, otherwise, you can also reach, us to us, reach out to us at info at um, So thank you all so much, appreciate the time.